Hi everybody, I'm Jackson Michael of The Game Before The Money. As you may know, The Game Before The Money is now a national weekly radio show on the Sports Map Radio Network, airing every Saturday at 10 a.m. Central. That's 11 a.m. Eastern. It's a one-hour program. You can listen on your local Sports Map Radio affiliate or at sportsmapradio.com. And also on the Sports Map Radio app. For the July 30th, 2022 episode, I interviewed Agent Lee Steinberg, who has represented many Hall of Famers. And he shared some great stories that were longer than the allotted radio segment. So I'm sharing the entire interview on the Game Before the Money podcast. Lee talked about representing Steve Barkowski who was the first overall pick in the 1975 NFL Draft. He shared about representing Hall of Fame quarterbacks Troy Aikman, Steve Young, and Warren Moon, and also Hall of Famers Derek Thomas and Thurman Thomas. And he gave a lot of great insight on the economics of the National Football League. Really interesting things, as Lee Steinberg has been around the National Football League for over 40 years. So kick back and enjoy. Don't forget to visit thegamebeforethemoney.com. And as always, thanks for listening. Your first client was Steve Bartkowski, and uh, the Falcons picked him first overall in 1975 as uh, quarterback of the future for them. What what was that like for you and and for him uh, going in through that experience? So I had been a grad counselor in an undergraduate dormitory, and they moved the freshman football team into the dorm. And one of the students was the quarterback on the team, Steve Barkowski. And I was in law school. I was actually student body president when the governor of California was Ronald Reagan. So every time we demonstrated, he cracked down, and I learned everything I needed to learn about the art of negotiation from dealing with then-governor, later President Reagan. But uh, after I graduated from law school, I was choosing between different jobs, and before I had a chance to go to work for the Alameda County District Attorney's Office, Barkowski asked me to represent him, and I was brimming with legal experience, just having passed the bar, and he was the number one pick overall. And we had the benefit of having another football league called the World Football League competing. So Bartkowski had leverage. He could sign with this new fledgling league. But uh, we ended up making a deal with the Falcons. It was the largest rookie contract of all time. And... When we went to sign the contract, we arrived in Atlanta at the airport the night before, and there were Cleeg lights flashing in the sky like for a movie premiere. A huge crowd was pressed up against the police line, and the first thing we heard was, we interrupt the Johnny Carson show to bring you a special news bulletin. Steve Bartkowski and his attorney, Lee Steinberg, had just arrived at the Atlanta airport. We switched you fly. For an interview. So I saw the idol worship and veneration that athletes were treated in, in many areas. They're the movie stars, they're the celebrities. And it made me reflect back on my dad's two core values, one of which was to treasure relationships, especially family. And the second was to make a meaningful difference in the world in a positive way and help people who couldn't help themselves. So I saw that athletes could be role models and That got me started. But there really wasn't much of a profession then. Teams could just hang up the phone and say, we don't deal with agents because there was no guaranteed right of representation. Yeah, and back back in those days, you know, a lot of players would negotiate their own contracts. And you're, you're kind of that first wave of professional agents. Exactly. But what I thought was if I could have these athletes retrace their roots, and go back to the high school community and set up a scholarship fund or work with the Boys and Girls Club or a church. They could lay down roots. And if they went to the collegiate institution and 
set up some form of a scholarship or a minority scholarship or gave money to the weight room, they could link up with those alums. So for Aikman endowed a full scholarship at UCLA or Warren Moon at the University of Washington or Kerry Collins at Penn State or Edwin James at the University of Miami. Then at the pro level, we challenge each of them to find some cause they would like to tackle and leave a legacy for. So we would set up a charitable foundation with leading business figures, political figures, and community leaders, all designed to implement a program. So that's work done putting the 200th uh, single mother and family into the first home they'll ever own by making the down payment and moving them in. So it's athletes changing lives. Yeah, and that's one of the, the great things about sports is is that it can do that. And, and also, it just brings so many different people together. People who don't normally share the same interests, they share the same interests in the, in the same team. And you can use the cultural symbols. NFL quarterbacks now are like the movie stars of the past. And you can use those symbols to trigger imitated behavior in a positive way. So the, when I represented the heavyweight boxer Lennox Lewis, he cut a public service announcement that said, real men don't hit women. And that could do more to trigger attitudes towards domestic violence, especially in rebellious athletes, than a thousand authority figures ever could. Sure. I mean, guys look up to athletes more than anyone a lot of times. One of the things I was curious, getting back to, to Steve Barkowski and that era, you know, he started, 75 was a 14-game season. I think the NFL went to a 16-game season in 77. And now we've got going from 16 to 17 games. Is there anything renegotiated in contracts for playing an extra game? Or was that something players talked about or negotiated during that time and now? Really, that was to add an extra game to the already enriched television package. And so back in 1976, right after I started, each team as the chair of the national television contract received $2 million. Last year, that was $200 million. So really what it did is it created First of all, some risk for players because by the end of the season, their their bodies have been just ravaged. So that's the downside. The upside is that this last year, every team made $200 million. And in a cratered economy because of the pandemic, they just negotiated a new TV contract where CBS and Fox put 83% more money than they did in the last TV contract. So teams are going to end up making $350 million per team per season just from national television. Wow, that is an unbelievable figure when you think back to when you started in the 70s. Think about the fact that the two franchises that came into the NFL, Tampa Bay and Seattle, had a purchase price of $16.5 million. When the next expansion happened in the league in 93, it was Carolina and Jacksonville, mm-hmm. and they their purchase price was $130 million. And today, the Dallas Cowboys are worth 5 to $6 billion. Yeah, that's incredible. And to think when, when Jerry Jones bought them from Bum Bright, they were supposedly losing money at the time. It's impossible to lose money now because mm-hmm. of brand new stadiums with naming rights and luxury boxes and jumbo scoreboard signage. And you've got fantasy sports and memorabilia. Last year, the top 100 television shows, 95 of them were sports events. That is unbelievable. Wow. Now, we were talking a a little bit about Jerry Jones taking over the the Cowboys, when he bought the Cowboys. And at that time, you represented Troy Aikman, the the first selection of the 89 draft. And um, Jerry Jones had just purchased the Cowboys. 
you've got a great story about that that I, I know you've shared at your sports media conferences. Well, Jerry Jones had bought this team, but he had fired Bill Brandt, who was the super scout, Tex Fram, who was their president, and the iconic coach, Tom Landry. And he was from Arkansas, so it wasn't a very smooth beginning. Um, but, um, you know, he was incredibly bright and, and incredibly resourceful. And I got the opportunity to be with him at the beginning. And what I said to him was, look, you need to brand that team. In other words, the Dallas Cowboys can be the Dallas Cowboys travel agency and the Dallas Cowboys cruise line. You can own the most successful entertainment company in the world, but you're going to have to cross market. And so, for example, if the league pours Coke and you own your stadium, you can pour Pepsi. So um, Jerry really was in that first group of innovative owners who changed the whole face of the NFL by understanding how to brand and market and, and uh, uh, see a larger world of opportunity. What were the negotiations like with, with him being a new owner and, and you being an experienced agent at, at that time and, and you had Troy Aikman right there? So when you have the first player in the draft, and this was before the cap came in, there was really no guidelines. So I remember at one point we had finished and we, it was clearly the biggest contract of all time. And Jerry asked me, so how should we term this? I said, well, most owners say that financial numbers are not disclosed back in those days, right? I said, but you've just done a very positive thing for the fans of Dallas. I said, I would step out there and talk about that you paid this huge amount of money to try to upgrade the team. So when the press conference came, he came out and said, this is the biggest contract ever I got the best player, and I brought him to Dallas. So I knew Jerry was going to be just fine running that franchise. (laughs) And, um, you know, you represented so many great quarterbacks. Um, And one guy I'd like to talk about is uh, is Steve Young. And at that time, the USFL was starting. So can you kind of talk about what that situation was like for you? Kind of similar, I guess, with the World Football League, but the USFL was seemingly had a little bit more finances. They did, and they had picked the draft clean. I mean, in their first two years, they signed Jim Kelly and Steve Young and Herschel Walker and Mike Rozier and Reggie White. They really picked the draft clean of big superstars, and they had a TV contract, and... um, I think they would have made it, but a certain individual owner who uh, later was president wanted them to play in the fall where they'd be in direct competition, so it didn't make it. But it was a really heady time because at that point, the NFL had contracts that had an option clause in them that said that if they couldn't agree on a new contract, the player was obligated to stay with the same team as long as they were paid 10% more than they had paid the year before. So a player making $500,000 who should be making $3 million, the team could just force him to play an extra year for $550,000. So there was no leverage. So all of a sudden this new league comes together, and Steve Young hadn't really thought about playing in it. Roger Staubach was his hero, and... And had a picture above his bed, but they brought in Sid Gilman, the architect of the modern passing game, John Hagel, who had just coached John Elway the year before as a rookie, and a really talented crew. And he figured Cincinnati had the first pick in that draft, and they had an incumbent, which was Kenny Anderson. Well, Steve just wanted to get out there and play. So the contract ended up being, because of leverage, largest in the history of pro sports. And I remember watching Dan Rather lead the uh, CBS Evening News with this amazing contract. And there were headlines around the world. 
And the irony of it was that here was Steve Young who didn't even cash some of his checks and he had just signed this prodigious contract. So uh, he went off and had some adventures there and then ended up in Tampa and then ultimately in San Francisco. Yeah, it's interesting. A lot of people forget that he started his career with the LA Express right. um, of the USFL. And also a lot of people forget about another one of your great quarterback clients. He started his career in the Canadian Football League. That's Warren Moon. That was a really difficult situation. Um, I've, I've talked to Warren a little bit about it. You know, he said he was ready to give up football if he couldn't play quarterback. What was that like for you as his agent, and, and what was kind of everything going on behind the scenes? There was a fair amount of prejudice and doubt in scouting circles and front offices about whether blacks had the intellectual capability and leadership capability of playing the so-called thinking positions in football, which were quarterback, at that time safety, center, middle linebacker. And so as we were going through scouting, there were teams interested in him at quarterback, but probably in a lower round. I think he certainly would have been drafted. But he also wanted to play. And he got a great opportunity with the Edmonton Eskimos. And he was MVP and league player of the year. And that set up a situation where in 1984, he came back and there were three leagues, the USFL, the Canadian Football League, and the NFL. And 12 teams were interested because he was the first pure free agent that you could sign in his prime at the critical quarterback position. And all you had to do was sign him. There had never been free agency in the NFL. So we took a tour of the different cities and we're in Houston and Bud Adams points to an oil well and says, this can be yours, Warren. And uh, (laughs) we're out in Tampa and Hugh Coverhouse points at the Tampa sphere and says, you can own a couple floors in his building. And so it was really heavy because teams had not really competed. They had draft rights over players forever. And he ended up signing the biggest NFL contract with uh, Houston that guaranteed about 80% of the contract. And off he went. He played six years in the CFL, and he played 17 in the NFL. So he played actually in four different decades. That's right. He's a four-decade player. And, you know, what's incredible about Warren Moon is even though he missed his first six years of NFL play, he still was third all-time passing yardage when he retired in NFL history. Probably one of the highlights of my career was he asked me to present him at the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton that summer, and and he became the first African-American quarterback in the modern era to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. So he's sort of... Uh, inspiration to many younger players yeah and he certainly was provided so much joy watching him play growing up i wanted to ask you about another player in the 89 draft who went in the first round in the same draft to troy aikman that you represented and that was Derek thomas who really was dominant linebacker seven sacks in one game yeah the seattle quarterback that game wanted to <laughs> <laughs> Run for the hills, because I think it was David Craig. It was. It was David Craig. But I think what really distinguished Derek Thomas was he had lost his father, was shot down as a pilot in the war in Vietnam. And he stood next to President Clinton on Memorial Day and spoke to the hopes and dreams and heartbreak of all those young kids that lost parents in the Vietnam War. And he had... Uh, a real affinity for uh, literacy, and he ended up starting a foundation called Third and Long that provided reading help for all the kids in the Kansas City schools. So he was quite a role model. Yeah, wow, and, and, and incredible. I, di- I didn't know uh, any of that about him. We, we just know these guys as players, and it's really great to hear that they do so much good off the field because a lot of times you just hear the negative headlines 
Exactly. And look, news is anything aberrational. News is not an athlete who wakes up in his own house, drives safely to work, <laughs> finds autographs graciously, is interactive with the press, gives his whole performance, sets up a charitable foundation. News is is drunk driving and domestic violence and and so you get a distorted view of what athletes life is really like yeah because for the majority of them it is get up go to practice play the game yeah you also represented thurman thomas his situation was really interesting and I'd, i'd like to talk to you a little bit about that because coach levy told me that the Bills were even reluctant to pick him in the second round because he had an injury at Oklahoma State that teams were concerned about. What is it like as an agent walking a player through that process of getting drafted lower than than what their talent level really is? So he was resentful and had a chip on his shoulder and made the whole National Football League pay for the fact <laughs> They didn't draft him in the first round. And uh, what was unique about him is he was so much a percentage of the overall Buffalo offense because he not only ran from scrimmage, but he caught a ton of passes. And so he was a really invaluable player. I remember negotiating a contract for him, and I said, look, he has the same percentage of impact on the offense that a quarterback has or he should get a what a quarterback gets and we didn't get there but we did get the largest uh running back contract and then emmett smith uh later that summer held out and they got a dollar more than uh thurman players are very it's not the raw amount of money it's the comparison to other players it's the competitiveness and a lot a lot of people forget that kind of um, rivalry that, that Emmett Smith had with Thurman Thomas in, the, in that contract. Uh, Emmett even missed a couple of games that year before the contract got finalized. He did. It was one of the famous holdouts, which now, because of the salary cap, we don't have holdouts anymore uh, because there's really very little negotiability to a draftee's contract. That kind of brings me to one other thing I'd really like to learn from you about, because you were you were there in the mid seventies while other leagues were getting free agency, Major League Baseball, NBA, NHL. The NFL didn't get that until nineteen ninety three. Why do you think that was? What happened? Well, the the problem is that football players are not going to put you in mind of the Bolshevik workers' party storming the Kremlin for more money, right? (laughs) They have short playing careers, they have injuries, they have all the rest of it. And unlike the players in baseball, they've never won a strike. So the only leverage a union has is to threaten a strike or actually do a strike. And so how they won free agency was not through collective bargaining, it was because they won a court case and gave them leverage. Uh, they won the uh, uh, Reggie White, uh, Freeman McNeil case, and and that's how they got it. So they were the last lead to get it, and they agreed in that year to a salary cap. Well, fortunately, I had Drew Bledsoe that year, who was the first pick overall, and we did a creative contract called avoidable years and he ended up the salary cap did not end up reducing player salaries as a matter of fact they increased but I think it's that baseball has always had an advantage because the players play a long time they're together for 162 games a season the injury rate is not as catastrophic they have a heavy injury rate but it tends to be more minor things than football players blowing out their knees. And so the older players tell the younger players, you just stick together and we'll be fine. And um, they haven't had that tradition in the NFL. But because since 1987, 
they've had continuous play. That's one reason why the NFL is the dominant sport today, because they haven't had a strike. They haven't had a lockout, a real lockout. Oh, that's right. And and that 87 one was was really ugly with the replacement players. And, and 82 was was no fun for uh, for us fans either. What, what was it like as an agent going through those strikes? It was really hard because, among other things, when uh, Fred came in the 80s, um, the union took the position that a certified agent couldn't sign a player as a replacement. So it created a conflict because it might be in the best interest of a player who wasn't signed with the team to go get some experience, but then that was seen as breaking the strike. So the union decertified, which meant that it stopped charging for dues, and uh, th- there were very troubled times uh, during during that strike. And what happened is the NFL put on replacement games. And what they found out is obviously the quality wasn't as high. But if you had NFL graphics on television and NFL announcers, the same announcers, and you were watching a game, it didn't take much to think you were watching a real game. And um, so the players ultimately came back and settled. And then they had critical players like Joe Montana and Tony Dorsett and Howie Long cross the picket line. So... They didn't have complete unity. And when was post-93, what was your favorite moment of, of when the players finally got free agency? Well, um, all of a sudden opened it up, and so B-plus players got A-plus contracts because the truly invaluable players in the NFL never got the free agency. They had their contracts extended. Um and if that didn't work, there was one franchise tag. But, you know, there were fun days on the field. I remember Troy Aikman won his first Super Bowl, and we were in the limo driving back from the game. And I said, Troy, do you realize what just happened? He said, yeah, we won the football game. I said, no, you entered the field as Troy Aikman, very good quarterback, and now you're Troy Aikman, name and lights. You know, that's the effect of the... Super Bowl. Another time Steve Young had been in the shadow of Joe Montana for a number of years. We never would have let him go to San Francisco except that Bill Walsh said that Joe Montana had back problems and he probably wouldn't play anymore. So I never would have let him go somewhere where he was sitting behind an icon with all those things. So anyway, he throws six touchdown passes in the 94 Super Bowl against San Diego. He's MVP of the game. I run up to him on the field and hug him, and he says, the monkey's off my back. The monkey's off my back. (laughs) That was a fun moment. Yeah, Yeah, Yeah. that's that's great. Well, Lee, we're we're closing in on on our time frame here. Is there anything that you think is important that you you want to say or, or something that you want people to know that they wouldn't know otherwise? I've been exploring modalities and healing that can like hyperbaric oxygen and stem cell and light stem and a process called RTMS that can make players perform much better at a critical point in the game at the end and can bring players back to service quicker. And I still continue to fight the concussion fight. And I finally think we have some new treatments that may heal a brain. So biomed's experiencing a revolution. So I'm, trying to make a difference on those points. Yeah, it's it's really important because, you know, these are these are guys we all we all really enjoy. They bring us so many great memories on the field and then, you know, it is sad when a lot of them, you know, sometimes can't even remember it. Exactly. So, I think my fiduciary responsibility is more than just putting dollars in a bank book. I have to care about the health and safety of players and their ability to live a fruitful and joyful life after football. All righty. Well, thank you, Lee. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It was 
great getting to chat with you and um, really appreciate it. Bye-bye. Take care, Lee. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Game Before the Money podcast. Please visit thegamebeforethemoney.com and special thanks to Lee Steinberg. I'm Jackson Michael. This is the Game Before the Money.